Thank you again. Thank you for uh, inviting me to present here, and thank you all for holding out, sticking with us for the whole day. Uh, I may approach things a little less academically than some of my esteemed colleagues here. I'm not an academic by nature. I'm more of a journalist, uh, but I will try to, uh, you know, give you some stuff to think about at the same time. Now, we're here to talk about hip-hop. Most of us are pretty familiar with hip-hop. Uh, I could give you a just a quick, make sure we're on the same page, a few things that you could find out if you just did some Googling. Um, you would know, of course, that hip hop is um, run by a white, blonde, Australian woman, right? That's, that's facts, I saw that um, on Forbes. Um, hip hop, as you know, prevents uh, black and brown people in America from succeeding in the world, even more so than racism, right? Because that was on, on Fox News. Um, hip hop <laughs> is not community minded at all. There's not enough uh, activism and protest. Uh, Questlove actually said that, sorry. Uh, there's a singular commercial FM radio station from where I'm from in New York City that's the world's premier source for hip-hop music culture. The, the premier, the top choice. And of course, Frank Sinatra, you know, the godfather of hip-hop. Um, now I'm going to stop here before you run me back out of, out of Dodge. Uh, even a cursory knowledge of hip-hop would be enough to understand that these things are, you know, at best inaccurate and at worst uh, laughably absurd, but if you're among the 31 million people who do read Forbes.com or the uh, 2 million people who watch Fox and Friends show The Five uh, or the millions of people who listen to Hot 97 uh, or NPR or you read Billboard or you follow Questlove on Instagram, you would have heard these things practically word for word. So the, dissem the dissemination of such perceptions as fact and the general manner in which hip-hop is portrayed by the media, even how hip-hop media conducts itself, uh, represent practices that can be described as, and, you know, at best cultural mockery and at worst cultural genocide. So I want to quickly explore the public's perception of hip hop and call attention to some people and organizations who are responsible for these perceptions, uh, including some of these aforementioned examples. Uh, we'll look at why this matters and why uh, accurately reflecting the full spectrum of hip hop's artistic and cultural significance is imperative. So it's important to understand the history of hip hop and media as the road to how we got here is pretty interesting, uh, but to stay within the scope of the current relationship between hip hop and the media and due to time, I'll try to be brief. You know, there was a time that hip hop had a fairly diverse representation throughout media. There were print magazines like The Source and Double XL, and in their heyday, they presented a, a wide breadth of coverage of hip hop, including long form features, interviews, music reviews, and they covered even aspects of hip hop's wider cultural uh, landscape. In fact, the source, is, the source magazine, once called the Bible of hip hop, uh, was also taglined the magazine of hip hop, music, culture, and politics. So this demonstrated their early ideals that while the music was surely the most visible and lucrative aspect of this explosively expanding American youth culture, the culture part was not insignificant. In fact, let's, this is a good time to reinforce an ideal which it's often regarded as a given. It's gone extremely diluted over the years by media from all angles. Rap is something you do. Hip hop is something you live. And these words famously, of course, uttered by Karis One have become sacrosanct to hip hop's purveyors, protectors, preservers, and purists, but are increasingly lost on the general public. Even sadly, much of hip hop's own. Uh, the term hip hop, as you know, I'm sure we've talked about in the last couple of days, has now become almost exclusively synonymous with rap music. So this poses an interesting dilemma. Perhaps never before has a bona fide cultural movement, social movement, you know, uh, as was mentioned before, shared its name with a musical subset of itself. So it's kind of weird. The confusion is understandable. But in the face of increasing evidence that points to a pattern of cultural erasure, this distinction, when distinction is quite possibly more important now than ever before. So to ensure a universal understanding, the point again should be emphasized, hip hop is a culture. This is defined not by me, uh, but by academia, including Cornell University, which calls it a culture, and Yale University, which calls it a culture, and Harvard, Harvard University, that calls it a culture. It's a culture is defined by legacy media, like National Geographic, they know something about cultures because they're, they're, they go around the world and stuff. Uh, institutions like the John F. Kennedy, Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., just named Q-Tip the artistic director of hip hop culture, so they're calling it that. Um, it's defined uh, by uh, governments throughout the world, including our United States uh, Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. They have a program called Next Level, where they send artists to regions throughout the world to serve as cultural ambassadors, so they call it a culture. Uh, La Place, I assume, because I can't speak French. Uh, the newly constructed hip hop cultural center that's located in and partially financed by the city of Paris, France. So Paris says, yeah, of course, culture, hip hop culture center, we're gonna fund it. 
which is amazing, and I'm in New York, and we don't have one of those. More importantly, hip-hop is a culture as defined by its participants. Not only the plethora of artists and producers and DJs on the music front, not just the B-boys and B-girls and visual artists who continue to expand the boundaries of their respective crafts, but members of the hip-hop community, us, y'all, we, once mainly confined to inner-city minority communities, of course, hip-hop has since exploded its reach into suburbs and rural areas to every state in the Union and every country in the world. It's quite remarkable, but it's also equally remarkable as to how easily such a massive cultural phenomenon has ceded control of its own narrative. That's what I'm here to talk about a little bit. So, again, initially mainstream media, largely, I mean, you know, give or take, but initially was friendly to aspects of rap music, even if they're a little bit late to the party. Two years after the breakout success of Rapper's Delight, there was a, in 1979, uh, in 81, there was an ABC News 2020 story on hip hop. It shed light, a fairly positive light, on the new phenomenon of rap music, a few years late, but still. And they touched upon the potential of rap music to influence outside of just entertainment. Well, the segment pointed out that rap was likely to, quote, likely to uh, influence popular music for years to come, noting that, quote, it has tremendous staying power because it lets ordinary people express ideas they care about, in language they can relate to, put to music that they could dance to. Yeah. It talked about programs that were incorporating hip hop into educational settings at the time. This some 30 years before the reburgeoning hip hashtag hip hop ed movement that we're seeing today. Rap was shown it as, as a community building phenomenon. They highlighted park jams, they highlighted big festivals. They pointed out how rap was being accepted and incorporated into other genres of music. Right? We just talked about that. Used in advertising, used to encourage people to get involved in the political process. Again, back in 81. So coverage was, to borrow a media tagline, pretty fair and balanced at that time. Of course, as rap expanded and exploded in public consciousness, the content evolved as well. As rap started becoming increasingly bold, brash, and explicitly descriptive of harsh conditions and lifestyles, public opinion turned. Now, prominent examples include coverage of the 1990 obscenity case against the perennially sexually explicit Two Live crew, the law enforcement backla uh, backlash against NWA's F the Police in 1989, or the uproar over the pseudo rap of Ice T's Cop Killer in 1992. So these sorts of cases drew national attention. Middle America was being told quite convincingly at this point that maybe rap wasn't so great anymore, not so cute anymore. But ironically, rap was getting greater. Let's look at 1993. Recently, NPR created a series of stories called Hip Hop's Golden Year, stories about the game-changing albums of 1993. The inaugural story in their series, The Chronic, 20 years later, uh, that's my radio book, The Chronic, 20 years later, an audio document of the LA riots, began with, thank you, thank you, I'll be here all week, uh, began with, quote, our series about rap's greatest year, begins with the album that drew directly on cultural and social upheaval to make one of the most popular rap, uh, rap albums of all time. Talking about The Chronic. So from New York Magazine to many uh, uh, well thought out think pieces, a lot of other people, 1993 is largely regarded as a hugely transformational year for hip hop music. We'd agree? Sure, because why not? Now they say that, but back then, the New York Times, the nation's newspaper of record, Stories about rapper hip in 1993 were nearly exclusively focused on the negativity surrounding the genre. So an archive search that I did shows that during this year, so highly regarded in the pantheon of music history, the Times was really only telling stories like, quote, Harlem protest of rap lyrics draws debate and steamroller, if you remember Calvin, Reverend Calvin Butts with the steamroller, uh, quote, rap star and two others accused of murder. Radio station bans harmful music. Rap star and two friends indicted in sexual assault. The list goes on. There was, a I, uh, there was a complimentary piece about Snoop Dogg that was actually somewhat complimentary but backhanded in that it was asking to compare his lyrics about murdering a police officer with Ice T's lyrics about murdering a police officer. Like that was in a complimentary piece. So even the complimentary piece kind of backhanded compliments. A November 28th piece entitled Gangster Rappers, The Lives, The Lyrics practically shrugged off the mafia and things like child molestation as insignificant next to the scourge of rap music. It said, quote, from Mozart to Frank Sinatra to Michael Jackson, popular music has a long history of run-ins with the law. But the recent arrests of three major hip-hop artists on charges including sexual assault and murder have heightened concerns that some of these performers, particularly the stars of gangster rap, we talked about like the industry making that term, but here's the media helping push it along, have become dangerous emblems 
for an immensely popular, primarily black musical genre that celebrates violence, gangs, guns, and sexual conquest. So here's the New York Times talking about these emblems that they're creating by writing about all the negativity, you know. While mainstream media has softened somewhat in recent years, we still see many examples of hip hop prejudice. When Geraldo Rivera on Fox News made the comments I mentioned at the top about hip hop doing more damage to black and brown people, it's funny, than, than racism. It's worse than racism, according to Geraldo Rivera. We see that many still make these deep rooted connections between rap, hip hop, and violence. It's not just the violence factor, though. We see a general misunderstanding of hip hop's musical and cultural landscape by mainstream media, evidenced by the wording used in the Forbes.com article anointing Iggy Azalea, the white blonde Australian woman, as the one running hip hop. This general misunderstanding of hip hop is backed up in part by the results of a research study that I co-authored and published through the Center for Hip Hop Advocacy, which is a nonprofit organization that I founded in September last year. The study was designed to gauge public perception about rap and hip hop, and it yielded many interesting results. I'll give you one since time. The one statistic I found most telling shows that 67% of people, this is great, Americans across the board, all ages, you know, all everything, so great metrics, great methodology. The one statistic says 67% of people who don't listen to rap music say that it's negative. <laughs> right? They don't listen to, I've never been to Fiji. <laughs> I couldn't tell you whether it's nice or not. Like, I haven't been there. Um, so that's, that bugs me out. I don't even know how that could be. The aforementioned university, there's so many things that would say otherwise. The aforementioned universities have curriculum, departments, fellowships, archives, all dedicated to hip hop culture. There's a strong hip hop pedagogy movement demonstrating an increasing success at teaching with hip hop influenced methodology in the classrooms. It's happening, it's out there, it's, it's in the news, sort of. Broadway is completely revolutionized by Hamilton, right? Hip hop artists, uh, activists, and organizations continuously working on the front lines of the fight for social justice. Rap's biggest star, K Dot, expanded on all these issues, infusing self love with an avant garde musical approach, producing one of the most critically acclaimed albums ever, any genre. So it's popular to say that, hey, some of these aspects of rap and hip hop are coming back. I argue that they never left, uh, but are finding ways to emerge or re emerge or more emerge despite destructive media coverage, thanks to the internet and social media, but we need more. At one time, those hip hop magazines I mentioned, they helped balance the uninformed scales, but pay, per, for, uh, pay for print destroyed the source magazine. The overall downturn of the journalism industry as a whole silenced much of whatever qualified hip hop journalism existed before the age of bloggers and online destinations and such. So a quick example, I can give you dozens of how hip hop massacred its own transition to digital, uh, three transgressions that I wrote about in an editorial, or three different editorials, about globalgrind.com. You're familiar with this website? This is a brain, the website brainchild of Russell Simmons, the aforementioned hip hop pioneer magnate. Uh, this website flaunted the tagline for a good long time, the world according to hip hop. Well, the world according to hip hop engaged in unethical content scraping, which is basically plagiarism for profit. Uh, they engaged, what I saw them doing and called them out on it was for the sexual exploitation of a minor uh, for page views, for clicks. Uh, and the broadcast and social media signal boost of incorrect information to millions and millions of people under the guise of journalism. So these are, our, these are supposed to be our standard bearers in hip hop, online journalism, digital world, right? What's absurd is that these examples really didn't have anything to do with hip hop in the first place, but they were writing about them. Uh, they're just egregious examples of the lack of integrity or concern about how their actions represent hip hop. They just didn't care. In fact, the sexual exploitation revolved around Justin Bieber's girlfriend at the time, that's what they were writing them on, on the world according to hip hop, who was 16 years old. And they were salaciously parading her uh, around uh, as, via photo gallery on the site, and they were uh, spewing innuendo about what Bieber should do with that. <laughs> right? The incorrect information was in regard to the 2011 story of Troy Davis, uh, who was slated for death by lethal injection in this very state. Uh, there were, as there often are, last minute attempts to grant Davis a stay of execution, uh, as there and often are, questions about his conviction. Global Grind's Russell Simmons and editor-in-chief Michael Skolnick flying the flag of activism journalism as much as the nation was concerned about the story that was sitting on the edge of their seats. Uh, they reported uh, via Twitter, breaking news, capital letters, Troy Davis receives stay of execution. 
developing to their hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers. Russell Simmons immediately retweeted this to his Twitter followers. He had about a million of them. Celebrities, hip-hop blogs, radio station DJs all then retweeted this amazing news because celebrities, hip-hop blogs, and radio station DJs have no regard for fact-checking. They just tweet. The problem was Troy Davis did not receive a stay of execution, and then he was dead. Misinformation in this case, tragic, irresponsible, but it just as easily could have been dangerous. What if they were putting out some kind of information and people took action based on that misinformation? Something could have happened. Somebody might die. Some, something just, you know, it's just, it could be dangerous. For these individuals and companies to wield this kind of power with this kind of reach and continuously spread misinformation about hip hop culture, or while claiming to represent it, is it, it, is a, it, is, it is at best embarrassing and at worst, contributing to this erasure of an entire cultural movement. Without mainstream media understanding the nuances of hip hop music and culture and no one calling them on it, and without anyone holding hip hop's own media to, this, to account, this vast expanse of cultural and artistic phenomenon is almost destined to become buried in a mountain of ash. If we don't outmaneuver this hip hop Mount Vesuvius bars. There are a few organizations and yes, even outlets, I, I don't hate them all, but they do a decent job of representing hip hop, but it's not enough. When the weight of multi-million dollar radio, cable and online corporations and conglomerates control the narrative, well, they control the image. They control the destiny and they decide what history will say about hip hop. So it's up to us, academics, scholars, interested practitioners, to ensure that this doesn't happen. As such, this is the charge of my organization, the Center for Hip Hop Advocacy, that's my nonprofit voice, to increase public awareness and an understanding of hip hop music and culture through respectable journalism, original research, public outreach, workshops, all kinds of things, town hall meetings, whatever we got, we're working on some things, uh, and media slash corporate watchdogging, right? Because who else does that? Like, I'm very immersed in the New York City scene hip hop music and culture. I, I've run a magazine for seven years documenting it and I'm the guy out there. Despite what many have been led to believe, we're still the most progressive and diverse place on the planet for hip hop music and culture by far, period, 100%. You will not, there's nothing you can't find. But some of my stuck in the 90s heads hit me up when I speak about these things and they say, who cares? Who cares if the mainstream doesn't play us, if we just stole, uh, Applebee's was turned up down here yesterday. Who cares if the general public doesn't get us? So when I, filed, when I filed a petition with the FCC to shut down New York's flagship urban radio station, Hot 97, charging them with a failure to serve their community by claiming to be where hip hop lives, yet airing programming that only reflects a tiny sliver of rap music, much less hip hop culture, someone asked why bother? Why don't you just keep promoting the amazing people you already highlight in your magazine, wordsmiths, live bands, women, activists, substantive rap, hip hop educational organizations, pioneers, architects of hip hop music, that's what I do, so why not just do more of that? And I reminded them that attacking the station for disagreeing what they play is a fool's folly. And yes, there are issues with what's on the radio, but don't forget Mob Deep's gunshots used to make us levitate, you know, and Lil' Kim used to be scared of the D. And then she threw lips to it. So we had our, you know, it's been, we've always had to fight this battle. But the real goal here is that corporations can no longer be allowed to redefine what hip hop means simply to serve their greedy capitalistic desires. I reminded my heads that even more importantly, it's members of the general public, not hip hop heads, who often sign off on things like, I don't know, hip hop conferences at universities probably. These are the ones who greenlight films. These are the ones who book venues. They allow education programs to, be incorpor to incorporate hip hop in the school district. And as we learned from a talk yesterday, they decide whether or not rap lyrics should be admissible in a court of law. Regular people, general public. So while we may think of them as outsiders, it's those people we gotta target to open their mind to the possibility that when it comes to hip hop and rap, they've been horribly misled. Otherwise, we'll continue to watch the nuances of this unique American culture, born from black and brown Americans, a fact that must never be forgotten, that has become ubiquitous throughout the world, becomes co-opted, misappropriated, and potentially erased by those with a voice reach and power and vastly unhealthy ulterior motives. We'll watch as the general public, those with little knowledge or understanding of hip hop, many of which could be these gatekeepers, will be educated, not by the kind of intellectual discourse that I attempt to author in my writings, or that we're blessed to witness during this and other hip hop related conferences, but by stories like I mentioned in the beginning, where on his 100th birthday, 
Frank Sinatra was lauded in an All Things Considered piece on NPR to be the godfather of hip-hop. Not a godfather, the godfather. His, his something to nothing rise to fame and fortune, his run-ins with the law, the fact that he was name-checked by a couple of big rappers in, you know, 20 whatever. These were enough for this venerable, respectable, publicly funded media outlet to broadcast. Despite the fact that, aside from being absurd, hip hop already has anointed a godfather. Africa Bambada, obviously. We also have Cool Herc, who has been collectively anointed as the father of hip hop. And if you want to really look at it, the last poets, Gil Scott Heron, James Brown, Cab Calloway, Africa, all our ancestors of hip hop <laughs> that are infinitely more viable than old blue eyes, right? But NPR broadcast it, and no one called them out. Well, no, I did. <laughs> I called them out on it with a letter to the editor and a matching post on our website. But unlike Hot 97, who were legally obligated to respond, and they did to that thing, but that's another talk, NPR has yet to respond to being called out. But that's OK, because now they know that someone's watching. So this is the kind of work I've chosen to take on. It's not for me. This is for hip hop, to change the public perception, to slow the damaging erasure of hip hop's artistic and cultural contributions while bolstering the great work of individuals and organizations that are leading amazing incorporations of hip hop into fields like education, mental health therapy, international conflict resolution, technology. I was at a hip hop hackathon the other day. Fantastic. Now, the, the subtitle of this conference is The State of Hip Hop and, and Rap. And I have zero doubt that this is my the state of hip hop is strong. <laughs> Perhaps the strongest it's ever been. All the things the panelists earlier today want for hip hop, more art, you know, artistry, consciousness, conferences, a, a louder woman's voice, lyricism, positivity, LGBT, discussions, all of these things do exist. They're alive as independent artists tour the world. They're alive at end of the week, a 14 year running weekly New York City event that has expanded into four countries. It's alive at that culture center in France in art activism movements in Egypt that I just wrote about, uh, in a community center in Chicago that Rhyme Fest and them put together, in, a uh, in mental health facilities in the Bay Area, and in panel discussions, paper presentations, and breakdance workshops at a hip hop conference in Georgia. So the problem is, not enough people know that. So I'm gonna change that. Thank you. For Manny, um, as you discussed, U.S. hip hop is in danger of cultural genocide. How do, you, oh, I'm sorry. As you discussed, U.S. hip hop is in danger of cultural ge genocide because of uh, inaccurate narratives. Um, how do you correlate that with the actual genocide of black people, black people in particular who may be, you know, a part of hip hop culture? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, as a, I'm no, I'm a layman when it comes to uh, overall, uh, you know, social uh, history. Um, just I know what I know, uh, but I'm sure there are multiple parallels when you talk about. Uh, you know, we, I focus on music, so of course we know there's been uh, other examples of. Uh, you know, music and art forms that have been, again, co-opted and, you know, and, uh, and, and the history has been erased or, or skewed, you know, throughout the, throughout the years. And I'm sure that obviously it's happened, uh, you know, across the board. We're, you know, we're, we, we hear things today that, you know, st uh, stories that have been only recently come to light, you know, uh, uh, Bartman, you know, other things that came up just today that, you know, most people probably never even knew until, you know, last year on a meme that went through the internet, you know? So I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a great time right now for the fact that we can find out about a lot of history that's been previously uh, glossed over or, or again, skewed or, 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 or misrepresented. But it's also, I mean, it's a catch-22 because just as you know, I talk about the relatively disgusting state of music journalism, you know, particularly in hip hop, um, you know, there are fewer publications of record, stuff like this is sometimes only confined to the walls of academia and it's not really out to the general public as much as it should be. But so, so it's a good time, I say this about independent artists and musicians, it's a great time, but there's so many people trying to do it that it becomes a cluttered landscape. 
So I'm just saying, you know, in, in the grander scheme, that because of the access to information, you know, we have the opportunity to, to right some wrongs and correct some past uh, stories that have been mistold throughout the years. Um, so we see that a lot. If you, but again, it's like the media is the whole, the media is the center of evil for all of this. In fact, it, you know, you, it's out there, but you have to look for it. But it's not being given to you. It's not being offered in, a, in, a, in an easy way, but it's out there. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that really answers it. I, I, I just, um, yeah, I mean, well, the media gets it wrong all the time, but it's not just, I mean, it's the media, it's in fact history books, you know, it's, it's, it's school, uh, you know, curriculum that, that's been, uh, you know, I, I use the analogy sometimes, I try to find an analogy between hip hop and, and other, you know, it's not quite a religion, it's not, quite, you know, but I've always talked about like the Native Americans, and I've said, you know, at one point they were Indians. You know, we called them Indians. We were watching the cartoons in the morning and, oh, and running around all crazy and Bugs Bunny, whatever. And we see these like horribly sort of racist, you know, stereotypes and tropes. And at one point the Native Americans said, no, stop. You're not going to call us Indians anymore. You're not going to represent us this way. We have all this history and all this legacy and all this culture. And now we're going to take control of it and we're going to make sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's properly represented. I don't think hip hop's grown up enough to have done that yet. I haven't seen too many people with that kind of power or control or influence do that in hip hop, but there's certainly people like some of the media figures we talked about uh, you know, today, uh, you know, some of the authors that were mentioned today, you know, uh, Mark Anthony Neal and, and, and Melissa Harris Perry, you know, people who have like kind of this, uh, uh, the ability to use media to correct some of these wrongs, and I, I see some of that happening, and uh, you know, I hope for more of it. Yeah. Come on, it's hip hop, let's go. <laughs> I just had a question about, um, you talked about, this is a question for Walt about Trisha Rose and kind of, uh, you critiqued her in terms of talking about how she's asking hip hop artists to look at these kind of global issues, but she's missing um, getting them to talk about community issues. Um, and I, you know, I've observed some scholars who um, have gotten older and have been critiquing hip hop for a while and I've noticed that, and I'm not saying all, but in some of their work, they're really not concerned with younger artists that are coming out. And I've actually heard scholars say, and I found this a little disturbing, but I heard a scholar say, who had been around a long time in hip hop, you know, I had a, a student email me about a certain hip hop artist. And this student was a young, probably a freshman. And uh, this, this scholar said, you know, I told him, I don't care. You know, I'm in my 50s now, I don't listen to that. And I thought that was a very missed opportunity to connect with the student. And even if you don't know about that hip hop artist, that student could inform you. Mm -hmm. And that could be a chance for you to learn from them and, and collaborate with them in a discussion of some kind. So I'm wondering if you think, and I'm not trying to say Trisha Rose uh, did that or not, but is that something you see going on that relates to what you're talking about? That maybe older scholars are not keeping up with um, what younger artists are doing yeah. in some way. So I, can I just add on that real quick? Um, I made quick mention of it when I, when I was talking about this, but I, I've seen this a lot as well, where older artists as well, Questlove was the one I mentioned, where he, yeah. he came out and he said, you know, where's the activism, where's the politics in music? And hip-hop, you know, was what he was talking about, although he said, and he said, listen, you know, we all know that the Dixie Chicks, you know, kind of blacklisted themselves, but we need to see more of that. And I guess what he was saying was Jay-Z needs to make a protest song. And I, what I said to that is I don't care if Jay-Z makes a protest song because if Jay-Z wasn't making protest songs yesterday, why do I care about him making an obligatory one today? But Questlove, what you could be doing with the millions of people that are paying attention to you, is and this was around Ferguson, so you could talk about Taff Poe, who is on the ground in Ferguson, has been talking about these issues in Ferguson for the past umpty nine years, but it actually happened right around. So why don't you take this opportunity? And mo a lot, I, there's a few, you know, Talib's done it a couple times. Uh, and then Melly Mel was on Anthony Bourdain's show on CNN, and he's talking about, like, there's no good, there's nobody doing anything important anymore. And, you know, but take that opportunity to say, okay, but here's who is. Because you're doing a huge disservice to these young artists who are really spending every day of their life trying to convince people they exist. You know, from, from Tef Poe to The Reminders to, you know, Brother Ali to, I mean, you know, the list goes on to uh, people that are involved in, in this kind of activism. And not only that, sorry, I'm done. Activism is not just making songs. I'm from New York. I know cats that are rappers that were blocking the Brooklyn Bridge to protest Eric Garner. Yeah. They were out there, you know, risking their lives pretty much because now it isn't protest the same thing, right? Isn't that equal, unfortunately? Um, 
So they're out there doing that. They have an album release party and they have vendors, right? You sell things, right? You your T-shirts, your CDs, and they had Cop Watch there, which is the organization that you know advocates for filming the police when they're arresting people at their album release party. So no, Questlove, we got plenty of activism and protests in hip hop. You just got to come out from the ivory tower or the you know Afro Tower and, and come down. <laughs> I mean, you know, come down with us. We're still doing it, man. It's so. Right, so the same thing with Trisha Rose, and she might be yeah. doing the same thing, where it's like, don't discount what's happening here. If you're not, you gotta be, you gotta be kind of still in it. And if I can interject before we take the last question from Dr. Mills, I don't know though, Walter. I don't know if I agree with you there on the Rose part because of the way the text is set up. And so for me, I need the specificity of, of is it the part where it's Rose commentary, or is it the part where she's talking about one side, the the different sides that say what. I mean, because on the one side, she sets the text up in a way to say these are the arguments that typical people make about the paradigm of hip hop, and these are the counter arguments. And so the counter argument could be that, hey, you need to do these kind of global things. And there are embedded texts in there where Rose is talking specifically from her voice, where that first very page where she says hip hop is, in a, in a, is ill and is in a grave state. And so for me, I, I do I do understand that notion of, of yes, the naysayers, and, and I don't, I don't and I, I don't find Rose's scholarship to be as problematic, say, as Mark Anthony Neal, who is as, as quickly dismissive. I, I find Rose to be, to be fair-handed. I find her to be level-headed when it comes to that. But of course, everyone has blind spots. I'm just simply saying the way that the text is set up, we can't just automatically attribute that that is Rose's position on it. Because on the one hand, you do have those old nostalgic heads that do say that there needs to be some type of intervention and those are amongst the you're talking about the quest loves those could be the mark anthony Neals. i'm just not really ready to toss uh rolls out with the water just yet and i just say i disagree with it that's all okay we can disagree that's all right i don't have a question but i just wanted to make a quick observation that i think um to your points about people who are working in the industry who think they're doing the right thing mm. that there is hard to challenge, right? Because I've been in conversation with some of the people that you've named directly, um, and even experts or scholars in the academy, right, who we think of as sort of speaking for communities that we just have to figure out like different ways to hold multiple people accountable while bringing lots more voices into the conversation and, and figuring out how to open that up so that um, hip hop artists can be, ethnographers can tell their truth. Um, but and be held accountable, but right. not be the problem, right? Mm. Rather than obscuring the the bigger structural institutional issues that that I think you're trying to draw attention to. So I just it's not a question. But no, I it's think it's that valuable. Really I'm, I'm, you know, I, I started a, uh, an organization, and I'm trying to make sure that I tell these stories, and we're moderate, and we're making sure that everyone's at the table, and you know, all these different organizations are well represented, and not to be the the, the end all be all, but to also so we're doing two. We want to do two things. We want to call into kind of call out people that are kind of doing it wrong, but also just expose. There's multiple organizations. There's Zulu Nation, there's Temple of Hip Hop, there's Rocksteady Crew, and they all have their own kind of aspects to how hip hop should be treated or taught or seen. I don't want to say one is right or wrong. I want to make sure that they're all given equal footing so that we can you know, kind of have that. As, so that's what we're trying to do. Some of the work. Good. Give Walter and Manny a hand, please. Now, now we've ran...